Well, you know, there's no doubt who informs us about the world affects how we live in it. Currently, Big M Media with the, uh, within the Anglo-American power configuration is struggling to maintain the structural integrity of its narrative surrounding the ongoing conflict in the Middle East and the great refugee exodus that conflict has created. Crucial to any good yarn, of course, is the villain. In this case, the Black Hats or IS, known variously as ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, uh, and the Islamic State. Uh, these are the actors whose dastardliness makes anything done by us, naturally the heroes of this epic, just okay if not actually justified. But what if ISIL, ISIS, Daesh, and or the Islamic State is not who or what the storytellers say it is? What if the story is just that, a story invented to cover the real motives behind the nightmare unleashed on Syria and the whole of the Middle East? Tim Anderson is an Australian solidarity activist and academic at the University of Sydney. He has degrees in economics and international politics and a doctorate in the political economy of economic liberalization in Australia. While his scholarly studies uh, focus on economic development, human rights, and self-determination within the Asia-Pacific region and Latin America. His latest articles, published at Global Research, uh, Resource, uh, Research rather, explore the complex web of local and international interests at play in Syria and, the, uh, and in Iraq in this latest conflict. Uh, his latest article is The Dirty War in Syria, Washington Supports Islamic State, The Evidence. Welcome back to the program, Tim. Thanks, Chris. I'm glad I didn't lose you in that uh, in that long introduction. Now, now, Tim, I just mentioned your your latest article. Now, you promised that that, that there's evidence of this connection that you and I spoke about uh, or hinted around last year, almost a year ago, last March. Uh, what's your evidence, Tim? Yes, there's uh, an overwhelming amount of evidence. First of all, we have to start from the point that Washington has always pursued a regime change agenda in. Syria. You remember back in quite early in 2011, the, the mantra of Assad must go was being chanted across the Washington elite. Uh, we know now from U.S. intelligence that they said in 2012 that uh, it was obvious that, the, I'm quoting now, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda in Iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. They went on to say that their aim was establishing a, a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria, and that is exactly what the supporting powers, the West, the Gulf monarchies and Turkey, want in Syria. So you know the aim, uh, the motive was always there for regime change and to use the extremist groups there, whatever they say about moderate uh, rebels. Yes. We know also that most of the weapons that ISIS use are North American weapons. There's been a range of different explanations for that. Um, but we know also that the, the closest allies of the U.S. have indeed been the ones supplying ISIS, and more recently we know that the uh, the ISIS uh, oil export industry is backed by Turkey. And we know that senior U.S. officials, the vice president, the head of the U.S. armed forces, and uh, Lindsey Graham, the, the senator in charge of the defences, the defence uh, senate committee, have all admitted that their closest allies are supporting ISIS. So the evidence is really overwhelming um, of uh, indirect support through their closest regional allies. Uh, to that, we should add that a number of senior Iraqi officials, there's over half a dozen of them, have said that they believe that the US and Britain have been directly arming ISIS in Iraq. So there's really a very powerful uh, uh, group of evidence that, that goes to show that, that Washington has been uh, hiding its... Uh, its real relationships and it's pursuing what it said from the beginning, uh, a regime change agenda in Syria. Yeah, well, when we talked last March, there, were, there was a British plane that had been shot down and lo and behold, it was full of armament, armaments destined for uh, ISIS, ISIL, or whoever you want to call them here. I mean, does it matter who we call them, Tim? I mean, are, are, they, are, are the Americans, is this, are they supporting ISIS but not ISIL? Or are, can we lump these things in together and say this is really a, all uh, different names for the same thing? That's what most Syrians say. Most Syrians really call them Daesh or terrorists or mercenaries. Um, the people who are doing actual deals, you know, there's a certain amount of negotiation now where they've arranged surrenders, they call them ceasefires or whatever, and, uh, you know, exchange of prisoners and things like that. Those people do pay attention to the names because there are indeed names of particular groups and there's a certain amount of rivalry between the groups. I think, by the way, it's in the interests of 
the major sponsors, like the Saudis, for example, to keep them rather separate. Remember, when you create a Frankenstein's monster, it's better to have a number of small Frankenstein's monsters from their point of view so they don't turn on you because there's a, there's a degree of unpredictability about arming groups of mad uh, fanatics. Uh, so, But really, from the point of view of the Syrians, from, from the real... Uh, the real um, situation in Syria, it's really all much the same thing. If you look back at the history of um, how the US-funded, US-armed groups had defected and taken all arms across to ISIS, 1,000 on certain occasions, up to 3,000 on certain occasions, there's a smooth really transition of um, so-called rebel groups, so-called moderate groups across to ISIS and uh, most likely it's following the money flow effectively the biggest most successful group where the most resources are attracting the recruits from those other sorts of groups but ideologically there's no real difference between them well I mean, we've seen i mean canada was caught out supporting in, in, at least indirectly through its jordanian embassy uh the the smuggling of, of in this in the in one instance but only one of more than you know several uh british schoolgirls you know to become brides of isis uh you know smuggling them through turkey and i don't know what else they're up to we've seen other uh, collaborations uh, israel for example providing medical assistance to uh, uh wounded um, is soldiers and and who knows and and dropping bombs on selected uh, Syrian targets every now and then as well uh, uh, using a, a a rocket from fired fired from way out in the Mediterranean in the last instance blowing up an apartment building but i mean what uh, what's the goal here uh, is it just i mean if isis was put in power and replaced assad or some other so called as you mentioned uh, uh, moderate syrians i mean wouldn't they be turned on immediately as well i mean what What's what's the what is Syria supposed to look like, given a Western yeah. power success here? Yeah, you're, you're right to mention Israel's role there, and the Israeli state has not specifically denied that they're supporting ISIS because indeed they've promoted the idea they're providing humanitarian assistance to anti-Syrian government fighters, and when they've been questioned about which group they're from, they've said we support them all. Basically, uh, they haven't denied that they're supporting any particular uh, extremist group in Syria because the aim is regime change. Because from the Israeli point of view, and of course that's not a million miles away from Washington point of view, what they fear most is not particular uh, Islamist groups. Uh, it's the strong alliance between those states, um, Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah, and now including Iraq, because indeed Iraq has turned away from the U.S. Um, orbit more into um, uh, working with Russia and Syria and Iran. That's what they feel, that that's what they want to get rid of, basically. So um, the aim there is really regime change in, in Syria, and after that, Iran is still on the agenda, it's on the back burner at the moment. But it, it's true what you're saying, that uh, it appears to be a horrific outcome to empower uh, groups like ISIS across that region. But remember, they're a much lesser threat. If you look at Libya now, you see more or less the, the outcome of that. You've got that very outcome in Syria where, indeed, al-Qaeda groups, and now they've taken the moniker of uh, ISIS in um, uh, in in Libya as well, people who've been fated by well-known U.S. politicians like uh, Lindsey Graham and John McCain, for example. So the Libyan situation, which is, of course, a disaster for the Libyan people, is the sort of thing that they would prefer to have to um, take the the Syrian state, which is a relatively, relatively strong state and relatively consistent state in terms of its pluralism, but also in terms of its opposition to the ethnic cleansing going on in, in Palestine. Well, you know, when you speak about the the small Frankenstein's of, of Saudi Arabia, I wonder. I mean, a, after re regime change, if it is successful, if uh, Assad leaves, I don't think that there would be a single Syria as we recognize it today, but a bunch of little Syrias, little Frankenstein's, if you will. I mean, do we have an indication that this this uh, 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 balkanization is really the goal here uh, of a post-Assad Syria? I think it's a plan B. I think, the, like, as with Iraq, I think the, the plan A was to have a compliant uh, Baghdad in Iraq and a compliant Damascus in Syria, but if that doesn't work, the balkanisation um, is certainly um, the, the next step. Um, we saw a very, quite a detailed outline of this from the Brookings Institute in uh, July last year, July 2015, um, just 
more or less giving shape to what has been spoken of already, that uh, the idea of weakening a country like that. And remember, the, the Middle East has already been balkanised. Syria yeah. was already balkanised 100 years ago to create Lebanon, and um, then we've got Israel and so on. So um, that plan has been spelt out by US think tanks linked into Washington already. But um, as we've seen with the Russian intervention late last year, it's not going to happen, basically. And... Um, it's still being spoken about in elite circles in the US, but um, if you look at the principles which have been agreed on um, at Vienna and at Geneva before it, um, dismemberment of the Syrian state is specifically uh, prohibited um, to, to whatever extent we can place reliance on those sorts of things. Right. Um, but there has been a recognition of certain principles like the Syrian people must decide the fate of Syria and that their territorial integrity of Syria is going to be maintained. So those principles have emerged um, and all parties have agreed to them, but there's still there is still that idea um, uh, in the in the back of things that uh, the dismemberment of Syria, the creation of a of a state in eastern Syria, the consolidation of the proxy armies effectively of NATO and the Gulf Council in eastern Syria can be maintained. I mean, you've, there's a similar thing that, which has been going on longer in Iraq, and that is the particular Kurdish authority in the north of Iraq, led by Barzani, is playing a role to weaken the power of Baghdad in Iraq too. So that's that's in play um, uh, in parallel. Well, when you say the Syrian people will decide, that sounds great. I mean, when somebody at the UN says it, but, you know, which Syrian people? I mean, in regards to this great diaspora that's been going on, and Turkey plays a role. I mentioned how Canada was caught out, you know, use, using Turkey as a transit point to get in, uh, to, well, to get brides into Syria and who knows what else. I mean, there's also the exit uh, strategy of a lot of these uh, uh, refugees and now being released from the great camps in Turkey to Greece and, and greater Europe. Uh, you know what? What about this? Uh, you know, who, how are Syrians going to decide? Do they have a right of return? I haven't heard anybody speak about. You know, who's going to go? Will the Syrian people that have been chased out of Syria will they have a, a right of return, or will they get first dibs? Will they get their old property, even flattened as it is? Yeah, um, good point. Well, of course they do. Um, from the Syrian point of view, they do have a right of unlike unlike the Palestinians uh, leaving Palestine, leaving Israeli occupied territory, um, all Syrians have a right of return. And they would if the, if the war was, um, you know, if the conflict um, was resolved in some sort of way, they would come back, those ones in Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon. A number have come back already from um, from Lebanon with the, with the liberation of Homs City. There is a, a trickle, a, a small but steady trickle of thing, people going back into Homs, for example, uh, let's remember also the displaced people in Syria are mainly about two to one inside the country. So you've got all of those western cities, including Damascus, but also Latakia, Tartus, Aswada in the south, uh, Homs, have taken a lot of people from the conflict areas from the north and the northeast. So um, a, a number of those cities like Latakia and, and Sweda are double in size at the moment. So there is a movement of people um, back to their homes as the Syrian army, backed by the Russians and Iran, are, are gradually taking back villages um, in, in several parts of Syria. So that's not such a big issue. In terms of the Syrian people deciding, you remember that there was a presidential election in, in mid-2014, according to the Constitution, and that the participation rate in that election was the first competitive election in many years in Syria. There were three candidates. Um, Bashar al-Assad won overwhelmingly, but but what was important about that really, I think, is that the the participation rate was 73%. So even in the wartime situation of mid-2014, there was a very, very high participation rate, much higher, for example, than any presidential election in the US in, in recent times. So even though there were people who were, were able to vote at that time, uh, there was a great enthusiasm for voting, uh, including voting in, in foreign countries where it was allowed, and some of the NATO countries um, prevented it. But um, So there is a constitution in Syria, there is a state, there, there have been elections, there are new elections planned for the National Assembly, for example, in the next two years, um, because the last elections there were 2012. Um, the next presidential elections are planned for uh, 2020, I believe, or 2021. But that can be changed if there is a change to the constitution. The Syrian government has always said they are open to amendments to the constitution to allow legitimate uh, political players, political opposition, not 
terrorist groups. Here's, here's what's going on in his national sphere. A definition of the terrorist groups against whom there will be no truce and the opposition people who are legitimately being encouraged to participate in the political process. So th at the moment, the real, the substance, if you like, of these national talks are around that, defining which are the terrorist groups which are not going to be included and there will be no reconciliation and no truce, and which are the legitimate political players who can be included in the in the political resolution of this um, situation. Well, you know, like, like Milosevic and uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein, uh, Assad has been typified in the media here at least as being like the next Hitler and, and you know, anything that he says we can't believe. Uh, he's, he has said on more than one occasion that he would step down, he would leave power if that's what the that's what a poll said does that have any credibility can we believe that or i mean is he just playing us for fools oh, well he's he's saying that because um he believes uh that he has significant support in the country that's been borne out by all of the estimates even by his enemies and by the presidential election in 2014 so really He's talking in principle as the Russians talk in principle. You know, the, the problem is that the Western debate led by Washington is largely a, um, it's a regime change idea. You know, Assad mm -hmm. must go, Assad must go. It has nothing to do with international law, international principles on human rights. It's the great violator of the Syrian people's rights by, by claiming that outside players are going to determine who the government of Syria is going to be. That's why it's important that that principle recognised and reaffirmed both in Geneva and in um, Vienna more recently. So, um, for example, the Russians say also that they don't support any particular person in Syria. They support the right of the Syrian people to determine their own political system. They're not backing away from Assad in that sense. They're just saying, let's recognise international law here. And so that is why the great consistency of the Russian position, say, as against the US position, has been that it respects international law. And the Western position has really uh, taken, if you like, what I'd call an imperial prerogative to say that international law doesn't matter. You know, we are going to determine who are the bad guys and the good guys here, and we're going to have a solution that suits us. That's not the way it works, and it's not the way it's, uh, it's turning out. Well, it seems to be the way it has been working for a long time. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to Guerrilla Radio. I'm speaking today with Tim Anderson. Tim is an Australian solidarity activist and academic at the University of Sydney. He has degrees in economics and international politics, a doctorate in political economy of economic liberalization in Australia. He's been published in a range of academic journals, most recently in Health and Human Rights, the Pan-American Journal of Public Health, the International Journal of Cuban Studies, the Australian Journal of Human Rights, Latin America Perspective, the Journal of Iberian and Latin American Studies. You get the idea. He's doing a lot. We're speaking about his article as it appears at uh, my website, Guerrilla Radio Blogspot, and also at uh, Global Research. It's the Dirty War in Syria. Washington supports Islamic State. The evidence... Well, when you talked about regime change, Tim, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was stunned to see uh, um, uh, John Kerry, the Foreign Secretary, and, and Obama as well, saying, no, no, uh, regime change isn't what we want. When th it's Clearly, that's been the drumbeat for years, and all of a sudden they turned around on that uh, did I hear that wrong, or, or is that, or is this, or is this just rhetoric, or what? It is rhetoric, but it's a particular type of North American rhetoric that we become used to, isn't it? The, remember, the difference between the U.S. and the European powers is that the European powers all had a colonial past, and in many respects, they still want to vindicate and justify their colonial past. Whereas the U.S. as the dominant world power in the last seventy, eighty years has always or even longer than that, if we go back to the, the Spanish-American War, there's been this idea that the U.S. has not been a colonial power, even though they purchased the Philippines and took over the, the, the Spanish possessions and so on. Um, so there is a type of doublespeak, a North American type of doublespeak, I should say a U.S. type of doublespeak, I don't want to offend Canadian listeners, um, that is really always... A type of a double game, you know, that we are not, uh, we are support the freedom and independence and the democracy of independent peoples, but um, with imperial language in every other respect. There are some Europeans who are frustrated with this because they, they really believe in something they call new imperialism. So the US language is peculiar, and you recall there's a history of this 
this ugly thing they call plausible deniability when it comes to violence too, um, which was a concept developed really in context of all the dirty wars that were going on in, in Latin America. Mm. So it's not surprising that a similar sort of language comes back with the dirty wars in the Middle East. Well, there's been a lot going on and a lot of changes. The Russians you mentioned earlier coming in has really spun the wheel on this whole situation dramatically. And now we've seen last week with the uh, Saudi government uh, uh, going on a head-chopping spree, but killing significantly uh, uh, a very... um, uh, uh, a, a significant uh, uh, Sunni cleric uh, that uh, things have really hotted up between Iran and Saudi Arabia, longtime enemies. Uh, Tim, w- w- how does this play out in the context of Syria? Well, um, there's another type of uh, substitute story, I suppose, that's going around, which is to say that the Middle East conflict has something to do with a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I'd like to say that I think that's not very not very deep, because the role of Saudi Arabia in the Middle East is a very important one, but um, it's really, uh, it's better seen as a a very close um, collaborator with the US. I mean, Britain handed over Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabian monarchy, to President Eisenhower back in the 50s, and the Saudis, in my view, can't really do anything politically without approval from Washington. Arms, for example. Uh, You've got, for example, the Vice President Biden um, criticizes the Saudis or has criticized the Saudis for providing arms to extremist groups. But the U.S. arms, and the U.S. is a very tight uh, regime of controlling the re-export of their arms. There's a, there's a government department that actually issues the licenses for re-export of U.S. arms. They aren't just uh, given out willy-nilly to other states or other terrorist groups. So there is a double game going on, of course, with Washington here and in pretending that their their allies like Turkey and Qatar and and Saudi are are out of control. Indeed, some individuals from those countries have been uh, have been had sanctions placed on them in the U.S. One man in Qatar, I remember, for their their links to Al Qaeda groups. Uh, but it's a double game because um, the U.S. is is definitely uh, the puppet master behind these operations. Well, it, it, it doesn't bode well for our, our near future and, and not even for the longer future as well. Uh, it, it looks like there's another, the war drums are, are getting ready to expand. And, and did I say Sunni? I, I meant Shia, Cleric. But, uh, well, well, Tim Anderson, uh, we're fast out of time, but thanks a lot. And again, check out Tim's work at globalresearch.com and you can check it out, uh, Tim Anderson at uh, Gorilla. Uh, Grill Radio Blogspot. Blogspot. Ca. Thanks a lot for coming on again today, Tim.